Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us right here on The Right View. Welcome back to another episode of Ladies Tea. We got some great ladies, uh, a trio of blondes tonight, as it turns out, and I'm absolutely loving it. We are joined by host of The Liz Wheeler Show, of course, Liz Wheeler, and former Florida Attorney General, our good friend, Pam Bonney. Pam, um, Liz has been on Ladies Tea before. I know this is your first hurrah with us. Um, welcome to the show. We are so stoked to get you on. And um, we have a lot to talk about, ladies. I feel yeah. like there, there is always, there's no lack. Pam, I'm going to start real quick by telling you what I did this past weekend, um, uh -oh. because I know we're dog people. Liz, do you have a dog? I don't. No, no, we have we have fish. I don't know if that counts oh. as a pet or if that's a decoration, though. That's that's a pet. <laughs> a you pet. you you must care for a fish. So sure, we'll we'll give you that. Well, Pam and I are big uh, crazy dog people, rescue advocates, um, and I was part of the Big Dog Ranch Rescue. Uh, yeah. fundraiser this weekend. It's a two-day event down here in South Florida. And if you don't know about Big Dog Ranch, uh, let me just tell you, you should look them up. They are the largest cage-free, no-kill dog shelter in the United States of America. And actually, I think the world at that. Um, but Pam, I always love your stories about what you used to do back in the day when you would take dogs with you to the state capitol. Can you give us just a quick recap of that for people? Because yeah. people probably don't know this about you. And I absolutely love the story. Yeah, Laura, I think we got over 70 dogs adopted. Yeah. And I would carry them around cabinet meetings. And Liz, some of these dogs were 40 pounds, and I'm in my heels and my suit. <laughs> and I would, it personalizes a dog oh for you carrying them. And all of, all of our dogs got adopted. And so the very first cabinet meeting, they brought this like beautiful, fluffy designer looking rescue. And I'm like, no, no, no. I want the ugliest dogs Aww. that no one's going to look in the cage and take. And every one of our dogs got adopted. And Laura, to this day, people are still sending me pictures and texts. And oh, someone just I love lost it. one of their dogs after a decade. And rescue dogs are the best. And the I, best. I have one, and he is the love of my life. So. Yeah. Well, I, I want to say thank you. You have always done so much for animals, and I, I think it's awesome. Um, Liz, you know what? With the with the fish, you're also doing your part. Our fish need good homes as well, so keep that up. <laughs> Back in the day, by the way, Eric and I, we first started dating, and he didn't want to commit to getting a dog because that's like a real thing. Like if you get a dog as a couple, like it's official. You're um, we got fish together and we got these little crabs and they would have, it's not stone crabs, but they would have like one giant claw. So we called them like baby stone crabs because if you know stone <laughs> crabs, you have to leave one claw. And if you, yeah. anyway, um, so that was our, that's how our relationship let started. You, let me tell you why my husband doesn't let me help take care of the fish. This is why oh, I call no. them decorations because <laughs> we did the same thing, Laura. When we were dating, we got a fish too. It's like, that's like pre-engagement, yeah. right? When you get a pet together and exactly. fish like, I have an indeterminate lifespan, so it's not a huge commitment here. Yeah. And when we got these fish, I told him the story. I was like, oh, I had a fish when I was a kid. And he's like, oh, how old were you when you had this fish? I was like, well, my parents got me a little goldfish that I named Tiffany when I was three years old. And I was so excited about Tiffany. We had the bowl set up in my room, in my dresser. And I got so excited that I reached my hand in, my little three-year-old hand reached my hand in, got Tiffany and gave her a big hug because I loved her so much. And that was Tiffany's last day on earth. Oh no, <laughs> Tiffany. Oh, so I've never been allowed to help care for the fish since then. <laughs> yeah, let's We're gonna send you fish food. Oh my gosh, I know. Well, maybe yeah. we'll send you some sort of a, a net device so that we don't need to use the hands. Cause yeah, that'll do it every time. Yeah. Get them with the hands. Um, I hate to get off the topic of animals because, you know, that's I, I could talk about it the whole show. But we did have CPAC last week. Um, I was so proud to go and speak at CPAC on Friday. And then, of course, my father-in-law, former President Trump, was there on Saturday. And obviously, I think that's what everybody was kind of waiting for. Um, there was a straw poll that was done at CPAC. And my father-in-law received 62%. DeSantis got 20% of the vote. And then the VP pick was Carrie Lake, uh, according to the attendees of CPAC. Um, I kind of get you guys to weigh in on this because what I found most interesting was, it's no surprise to me, by the way, that people want Donald Trump back. I mean, we all know why. But the Democrats, when they asked who was going to run on the Democrat side, 
39 percent, only 39 percent, I should say, thought Joe Biden was going to run, which I mean, I think it should probably be lower than that, Liz. I don't know. 23 percent for Newsom, 14 percent for Michelle Obama. And at the very bottom, Kamala Harris. Liz, the current vice president is doing such a bad job (laughs) that they can't even put her above Michelle Obama, who I agree with that. I think Michelle is probably going to run. I mean, it's maybe a conspiracy theory. But you're the current vice president, and you can't even get more than someone who hasn't even indicated any interest. That's kind of sad. This doesn't surprise me at all, because Kamala Harris was a weird choice for Joe Biden to pick as his running mate. She was obviously, and I mean no disrespect personally, uh, just an objective analysis that she was a token. She was picked because she's a black woman. She was picked because of these immutable characteristics, which I find to be very insulting. I wouldn't want to be picked for anything any job based on the fact that I was a woman or based on the color of my skin, I'd want to be picked because I'm qualified. But remember her poll numbers in, not even her poll numbers, her vote numbers yeah. in the primary, she dropped out earlier than almost anyone else because even voters in her own party didn't like her. Voters in her own party rejected her. She's only continued the same kind of word salad, um, woke, Marxist, just detached from reality kind of speaking since she's become it, since she's become vice president. It's just become more prominent. More people have been exposed to it. So it actually, it it doesn't surprise me that she's that low on um, on that poll. But I, I agree with the majority of people. I don't think it's going to be Joe Biden. My bet yeah. would be Gavin Newsom. He is just chomping at the bit to get in the White House. Yeah, I mean, he's not doing a great job uh, with California in terms of his, you know, uh, telling people why he should run because California is absolutely in shambles. Um, Pam, I know that you have known my father-in-law for a long time. And as the uh, attorney general here in the state of Florida, I think you always were so spot on with everything that you used to talk about and you used to do. This is what my father-in-law said when he talked about why he is running again in 2024. And I think you probably, everybody probably saw this. He said, in 2016, I declared that I am your voice. Today I add that I am your warrior, your justice, and for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I mean, to me, people are looking almost for a retribution of sorts because we feel like we have been so forgotten now and so left behind. No one is looking out for real Americans out there anymore. I thought that this was such a great line from my father-in-law in his speech. Yeah, Laura, it was one of my favorites too. And you know, it's one of the first times that I haven't been at CPAC and I'm usually behind stage with you or running around. And it was actually fun to be at home watching it and listening yeah. to every word he said. And you know, one of my favorite things that he said, four words, I yes. have the experience. Boom, I have the experience and he does. And that's his resume. You, you know, many years ago, Steve Spurrier, who was a national coach for the Gators, wanted to come back to University of Florida. And they told him, submit a resume. And you know what he said? My national championship is my resume. Oh. And look what Donald Trump has done. He's done it. it. He's got the resume. He's got the pedigree. He's been there. He fixed our world. And he's the only one who can fix it again. And look, we're all used to huge Republican primaries. That's what we do. And, you know, as long as we don't tear each other up, I don't think we are. I know President Trump is going to be the clear leader. He already is in this. This people of CPAC spoke. And I think we're going to see a lot of other people jump in the race. And probably a lot of people, Laura, I think, who really want to be VP. And yeah. they're contending to be his vice president. So, so they're jumping in the race. But he's got the experience. And he is our retribution. And he's exactly what our country has to have right now. Well, I mean, I think I I totally agree with all that. I think a lot of people are probably going to get into a race because, I mean, who doesn't want to say they ran for president? That's kind of cool. And then you obviously are kind of submitting, speaking of submitting a resume, submitting your resume of sorts to then become vice president uh, or the running mates, so to speak, of of whoever the nominee becomes. Um, But Liz, none of it matters if we don't feel like we have free and fair elections. And one of the things that I thought was so smart that my father-in-law talked about is he said that Republicans must compete by using all lawful means to win. I think the days of, you know, sending everyone to go vote on Election Day are over. I think us, you know, we're as a Republican Party trying to say, well, we are we are so above board with everything that we don't want to go out and, and do any ballot harvesting, even if it's legal, because that's not who we are. 
we better be ballot harvesting. We better go to churches. We better go to NRA conventions. We better go everywhere where Republicans and freedom-loving patriots gather and bank those votes. We better get people out early to vote because that is what the Democrats have done. And they have, I hate to say it, beat us at our game doing it. Um, and I love that my father-in-law talked about that because I think that is a very important point as well. Yeah, one of the things that I've been saying on my show since the 2020 election, but ramped up even more since the 2022 midterms, that we all expected to be this red tsunami. And we technically won the election, of course, but it wasn't the red wave that everyone wanted it to be. As I said, if we do not acknowledge the reality of the political enemy that we face, then we will not fight well against them. And if we don't fight well against them, we will not win. And I want to win. And I find that to be a perfect lens through which to judge any Republican, whether it's a presidential candidate, whether it's a member of Congress, a senator, a governor, if the individual who wants to serve in public office cannot define what happened in 2020, if they cannot define what electioneering means, if they cannot prescribe a remedy for that, if they're afraid that it might be unpopular to speak out in defense of the January 6th defendants, if they mm -hmm. cannot actually say, listen, we're up against Marxists, Marxists who used a legal way, legal, and I mean not lawful, but the legal system to change the procedures in the states yep. around our countries prior to the elections, which caused it to be a rigged outcome or a rigged process that led to a different outcome. If they cannot acknowledge that because they're too afraid, if they cannot acknowledge that because they're unwilling to do their own research to find out what the specifics are of what happened, then they're not going to be the correct fighter. We saw that for sure in 2022. That midterm election showed us that even when we as Republicans own public opinion on critical race theory, on queer theory, on parental rights, on inflation, on the war in Ukraine, even when the majority of the voters are dissatisfied with the Democrats, with Joe Biden, with Nancy Pelosi, if we do not compete with the Democrats in their election shenanigans, for lack of a better word, of course, we want to do it legally, then we're never going to be able to win elections no matter what platform we have. And I'm interviewing all of the candidates for the Republican side. I echo what Pam says. I have zero problem with candidates jumping into this. I actually feel very encouraged when there's a lot of candidates because it shows me that we have a deep bench. We want to mm -hmm. be developing candidates because it's not just this presidential run or the next one. It's for the next generation, hopefully our country long after we're dead. I want the I want that to be built up. I want these candidates to start learning how to be uh, national level candidates. So I have no problem with that. But the question that I always ask them is, can you define the political enemy that we're facing and what happened in the 2020 election define electioneering? If they can't answer that, that's a disqualifier for me. Wow, I love that, Liz. That is so smart. And and I think you're exactly right. Um, I, if you can't truly talk about what happened and why it happened, then you gotta go. Because if we don't get that fixed, I mean, what's the point of any of it, right? I mean, no, nothing even matters if, yeah. if we can't actually compete head to head because they have such an advantage over us that we, because we're not willing to actually talk about the problem that exists. Um, I think it's so smart. And I, I like it, too, when there are more people involved. I think back to 2015 and 2016. And if you remember, there were 17 candidates yeah. running for that uh, Republican nomination. And man, those debates, what a fun time. I hope we have more of that. I'd like to go back uh, in time a little bit and like replay those because, man, that was a crazy time. But I think it makes all of our potential candidates better for the future. I love seeing young people get in. And you know what? Obviously, we know who I'm, I'm backing in this one. But maybe those are people that down the line, yeah, no surprise. Maybe those are people who down the line become, you know, bigger players on a national level. And I think experience is golden and I absolutely love to see it. So, uh, man, I we got to check out your show to find out what everybody says and what their yeah. response is. Um, you know, I something that I think is going to be very important to uh, all people who go to vote and especially to parents in this 2024 election parental rights obviously is a big deal. As a mom of two kids myself, I look around and I always see, and I'm sure you guys see it too, these videos of kids at like drag shows. And I'm, first of all, I'm trying to figure out why, what, what adult would ever think that it was acceptable to take a child to a drag show? I mean, this is a cabaret type show. This isn't just, you know, men who are dressed up 
as women in dresses and a lot of makeup and big wigs, this is like very sexual in nature. There's a lot of uh, sexual innuendo. There are clothes coming off. There are men in thongs dressed as women. I can't even imagine how confusing all of this might be to kids. Um, but something just happened in Tennessee. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee signed into law a ban on child sex changes and restricted drag performances at any public space. And I have to tell you, Pam, I think this is a step in the right direction. It's sad that we have had to say to adults out there, it's probably not acceptable for a child to be exposed to this sort of thing. Um, but I think that it, I'm appalled every time I see these drag performances and there are children of any age, and a lot of them are very young there. So shout out to uh, the governor of Tennessee on this one. Yeah, and, and Laura, you, you know, I'm glad you said it because these aren't 17 year olds, you know, 16 yeah. year olds. These are little kids. And frankly, it's a shame that we have to legislate this, isn't it? Right. Would you have ever thought that we would have to create laws to stop this in our society? And, you know, whether it's a, a drag show, heterosexual, gay, it doesn't matter. These are children mm -hmm. viewing things they should <clears throat> not be viewing. It's tough enough to be a kid right now in this world with social media and everything going on and everything they see on the internet and the bullying and the peer pressure and the suicide rate is through the roof for children. We need to keep our children children as long as we can. And we need to, we have to guard the books that they're reading in schools. Oh, because yeah. Because I was looking at some of these books that they were in Florida that, 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 that are banned now by Richard Corcoran, our commissioner of education, our former commissioner of education, and they were horrific. They were things that the three of us would not be reading. And they are putting them in elementary schools and middle schools. So, yeah, I'm glad that our governors are all around the country taking the effort to ban these things and to protect our kids. That's the only, that's what we got. That's what we have yeah. to do. I mean, think about how, how our future generations, I mean, honestly, Liz, quite frankly, how screwed up these kids are going to be if this is the kind of stuff that we're exposing them to. But I think Pam brings up a good point. It is so sad that we have had to legislate this, but I feel like this is what prompts people to say this isn't just, you know, Republican versus Democrat, left versus right, liberal versus conservative. This is good versus evil because what adult yes. thinks it's acceptable to expose kids to this stuff, to put books like this in our school libraries? Uh, to me, this just shows us that we are really uh, our society is in a, a really bad trajectory at this point. It certainly is. And a word you used before when you were introducing this story, I think, is the key word here. And that word is confusion. The yeah. purpose of exposing small children not to I don't even like the term drag queen. Honestly, these are transgender strippers. They're men who are yeah. like, gyrating and dressed in lingerie thongs. They are dancing sexually and they're, they're, they're dressed as this hyper sexualized version of women. It's actually a derogatory impersonation of women to begin with. But it's, it's a strip show, right? It's 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 a yeah. graphically sexual show. And the intention here is not to expose children to this so that so that they become more tolerant of queer people. The intention here is to confuse children. And th this is what I mean. This is actually a perfect example of what I mean when I say we have to understand the reality. We have to acknowledge the reality of the political enemy that we face. Because if we just look at this and say, like, who does this? Like, what kind of nutcase would want to dance like this in front of a child, a pedophile? Maybe that's true, but it's also part of the larger Marxist strategy. It's part of queer theory. Queer theory is the ideological underpinning of this transgender craze, and queer theory actually calls for the sexualization of children because queer theory says all sex is political. This is how they're trying to groom the next generation of children into Marxist revolutionaries. They're trying to destroy their identity as children so that they are grasping and groping and confused as young adults, and they choose a Marxist identity as, as some sort of redemption for what they're told is maybe they're white children, they're evil, but you can redeem mm -hmm. yourself if you choose this other identity, this queer theory identity. When you look at it through these lens, you understand what they're doing. It makes more sense, and we, by the way, have an absolute right to ban this stuff. I know there's a lot of libertarians out there who say, well, parents' rights, aren't you the ones saying that that parents' rights are the highest on the totem pole here? And I would say we have tons of laws that govern 
public's behavior towards children. We don't even let children walk through the floor of a casino. We have right. tons of laws that don't just defer to parents when it comes to abusing children, which is exactly what it is when parents take children to a drag show, a, a, a transgender stripper that's sexually gyrating. So we absolutely have legal precedent to do this. I hope these laws pass in all 50 states. Yeah, I mean, are kids allowed in normal strip clubs? Like, could a kid go into a strip club where where women are stripping for men, I guess, or other women who want to see it? I, no. I assume the answer is no, right? So why yeah. is this any different? Just because someone labels themselves as a, a certain way, that, that should have no bearing on it. If kids aren't allowed to see it, you know, in one respect, they shouldn't be allowed to see it in another. Um, but I don't know what's going through the heads of these adults who are exposing kids to this stuff. Someone who I, I don't know exactly where he stands on on this particular issue, but someone who we talk about a lot, who continues to impress me is Bill Maher. Um, he actually was uh, interviewed by Jake Tapper, and he was talking about the fact that when it relates to trans issues, um, that the trans community is asking for maybe a little too much not to be the, you know, like the butt of jokes of comedians, like Dave Chappelle apparently has some jokes about the trans community. The truth is, if you want to be part of society, you better be able to take all of it, you know, whether you label yourself one thing or another. Um, and he also brought up the point, Pam, that I think is is so important, which is that there is an effort, I think, whenever you want to bring up these issues to shut down debate on them, that no one should be able to opine on these trans issues because these people feel the way they feel and we should all just shut up about it and move on. But as it relates, of course, to young children who might think that they are, you know, trans or in the wrong body or whatever it might be, um, you know, we should be having a debate about it because we never want to see children mutilated beyond repair and then decide as four out of five of them do apparently who have gender confusion, um, you know, a couple of years later that I made a mistake and that's not at all what I wanted to do. So he's saying we need to be able to have debate, but as he pointed out, so many people who wanna talk about it are shut down. And of course we're told that we're transphobic or where they try to cancel you or whatever it might be. Uh, I think Bill Maher is exactly right. We need to be talking more about it, not less. Yeah, we need to have intelligent debate. And, and if you use that word, you get shut down. Yeah. And as President Trump said, it, these are not, again, 16, 17-year-olds. These are small children. And these, these are kids who haven't even decided, can't decide what they want to eat for dinner. Yeah. And their parents are encouraging them to change their sexual organs and allowing that to happen. So, yeah, there's got to be a lot of discussion about that. We have to in the world in which we live now. And, you know, the, the, and we can keep going on the, the boys and women's sports and girls' sports. I mean, it's just, it's all across the board. It's confusing for children and there has to be discussion and there has to be finality on it. Yeah, uh, all I know is that um, uh, if you want a great example of you put a kid in charge and what happens, my five-year-old went, I'm going to blow, uh, blow up my husband's spot here real quick, went with my husband for several hours yesterday and was supposed to like eat lunch and do all of this. And he comes home and he doesn't feel great. And I'm like, well, what has he eaten? And he goes, oh, he told me all he wanted were jelly beans. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, so whenever we're letting the kids decide... They are choosing, Liz, jelly beans. Um, but look, I, I, I'm all about do what makes you happy. And if you are an adult and you choose this path for yourself, that is great. But there is there is far too much um, confusion for kids right now for them to be making these decisions, these life altering decisions. I think about things, you know, outfits that I wore whenever I was like 15 or 13. And my mom told me, that doesn't look good on you. And I was like, this looks great. And of course, I look back and I'm like, man, my mom was right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think more talk is better than less in this space. And I don't think that anyone should take offense to it. Like, I, do what, again, whatever you want, as far as I'm concerned, I think as far as a lot of people are concerned, but leave the kids out of it, please. Yeah. You can't even drive a car until you're 16. You yeah. Know Drink legally until you're 21. Yeah. It doesn't even make sense. It's exactly right. All right. Now, this is a total uh, change of pace here, but I, I know I use a lot of emojis. And apparently... <laughs> you do. 
I do use, I know, I, we text a lot, Pam. I, I use a lot of emojis, and apparently, um, even if you're using the happy emojis, a recent study says that um, uh, people who use happy emojis are hiding negative feelings. All right, here's my thing with all of this, Liz, is can we just, do we have to study everything? Is this the best use of our scientists' time to be studying emojis and all this stuff? Apparently, too, it says if you do a thumbs up that you're passive aggressive, according to Gen Z, <laughs> and that only old people <laughs> use the crying with laughter emoji. I guess I'm officially so old. <laughs> That's the most common emoji that I use is the crying with laughter. Oh. I, I read that study and I thought it was interesting because it seems like there, there is a generational difference that Gen Z uses those uh, emojis, especially the happy emojis, to say passive aggressive things, but to try to soften it. And our generation uses them as a replacement for the facial expressions that we would respond with in that situation. That's how I use them. Because that, when I saw yeah. this topic, I was like, I, I scrolled through my text and I was like, do I do this? Is this having <laughs> negative emotions? And I was like, no, I oftentimes send laughing faces instead of saying ha ha, because it's stupid to say ha ha when you can send a laughing face. And I yeah. send a thumbs up because it's one, you, it's one button versus saying, okay, great. Um, so maybe yeah. it's a generational difference. I don't think our generation has a problem being just like straight up aggressive. We just say yeah. like, oh no, that's dumb. Whereas Gen Z is so afraid of offending people from their yeah. safe spaces that they have to couch it by being like, that's dumb, smiley face, smiley face. No, I think that's yeah. right. I mean, I guess the one that might not get confused, uh, Pam, is like if you said the middle finger one, I think that's just like a baseline. <laughs> Everyone knows. What I the, need to find that one, yeah, for some people. Well, now, and if you do the prayer emoji, that means I'm praying for you. And if you get the heart emoji, that means I love you. <laughs> right. Not I know. Impressive. You know what? I actually, when people don't use emojis, and maybe this is like a problem that I personally have, it makes me like slightly uncomfortable. Like, oh, maybe they're, and, and see, this is where we, it's like a slippery slope now with these emojis, because I guess I'm used to being very expressive with them. And when people give me like zero emojis, I'm like, oh my God, do they hate me? Like, what have I done to upset this person that they can't, you know, <laughs> give all of themselves to me? I want to know what emojis you are using out there. It, I actually use the one, the crying with laughter one quite often. Um, the 100, sometimes I use instead of like in place of like a thumbs up. I'll do, but what are, uh, uh, Pam, what are you using the most? What are your emojis? I use the cry with laughter. I use heart. I use praying a lot. I use fingers crossed. Um, I need to find that middle finger one that for <laughs> a few people. <laughs> oh my God. What I about know, you, Liz? I just thought of a great example. I do use, I do use an emoji to mask something. I do use, this is one example. And I have to say, I learned this. I have, my youngest sister is 13 years younger than me. So she's still in college. I'm 33. She's 20. And she taught me this, this phrase that Gen Z uses all the time. Oh. If they, like, if I send her an outfit and I'm like, oh, do I look cute? And she sends me no red heart. And it's something that's actually crept into my verbal. Like I will say no red heart on the phone when I just mean like, oh, totally ugly because it's saying just no, unequivocally no. No, but, but I love you. Heart, like I still love you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. bless your heart. So bless I have to heart. say, let me revise my answer. I send one passive aggressive, lovely emoji. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can I, you know what is interesting though, as, and I'm, I'm feeling now like really old as my kids, obviously my kids don't have phones. They don't text They're three and five, but I know that all the parents now are trying to decipher what their kids are saying in like text messages to to other friends because they use there's like code now with all the emojis they all mean different things now so that is actually something that that frightens me as a parent down the line whenever i don't even know 10 years from now or something when i actually have to deal with this um although if the democrats have their way we'll just have like chips implanted in our heads we don't even have phones anymore um but it, that is that's so scary because you i don't know now what like so this is an example your 20 year old sister liz I wouldn't have uh, really been able to decipher that. And um, I, I don't know how to keep up with it. We need like a handbook for old people on emojis at some point and like how to, somebody could make a lot of money if they could get all the all the info from the, the young folks, as they say, mm -hmm. and, and decipher it for us because officially I think I'm getting old. Um, something we talk about a lot on this show, airplanes. Um, apparently there's an expert that has given you some do's and don'ts on the airplanes, here are things that you should always do. You should always wear footwear. 
I mean, is anybody who's not wearing footwear on an airplane? And I, I recently heard, though, from one of my friends that he takes his shoes off and wears his socks in the bathroom. I mean, oh. I don't. That's pretty gross. No red heart. You send no. him back and you say no red heart. No red heart on that. Exactly, oh. Liz. You should always <laughs> pre-order a meal, apparently. And if you've paid for your seat, you should never get it, give it up. Um, now, this expert, so to speak, says you shouldn't stand as soon as you land and they like ding that bell. Excuse me. I've got to get up. I've been sitting on this plane. You guys had a sitting waiting to taxi out. You had a sitting waiting to be like the 12th plane in line to take off. Sitting on the plane the whole time. I want to stand up. Are you, do you guys, I mean, Pam, what's your stance on this? Are you standing up as soon as the plane like dings and you can get up? My belt is unbuckled yeah. and I'm up. The second that, that bell dings. And you know what else, Laura? I trade seats too, especially if it's kind of good karma, especially if there's a couple yes. or a mom with a child, of course. You're always going to trade seats because sometimes you're going to want to trade seats. If I'm by myself, I have no problem. You know, and it's it's never going to be more than a couple rows from where I was sitting. And and I don't know. I just think that's being kind to other people. I'm I'm all about that too. And I've I've been more than happy to do that myself. I, I don't really know the rationale behind this, but that's a, a really good way to get the middle finger emoji uh, given to you on an airplane, Liz, is if you're not switching seats and somebody, I mean, it's so easy, you know, who cares? I actually like the aisle better than the uh, window because I get up, I've said this before in the show, get up and go to the bathroom quite often. And I don't want to have to make the whole row get up and move for me. So if, if anyone is sitting on the aisle, I offer them the window very kindly and they don't have to take it. I just offer it. Oh, if you would rather. Um, but what is, what's your stance on standing up? Are you standing up when the plane lands as soon as it, it dings? If not before, I travel yeah. a lot with my daughter. And so I'm one, I'm one of those people that'll travel up and down the aisle with her a few times, not in a disruptive way, just so that she's not cramped in that seat for so many hours. So yeah, I'm standing up the second. And by the way, yeah. people, this is an interesting observation from this pilot or this, this aviation expert about trading seats, because I've asked people a couple of times to trade seats with me. If, if Laura, you probably experienced this with young kids, but on some planes, they only have the extra oxygen masks on one side of the plane. Yes. So we'll book like my husband and I will book seats next to each other. And my daughter's been on my lap until she just turned two. But then when we get to the gate, they'll be like, oh, actually, you can't sit on that side of the plane because it doesn't have mm -hmm. an oxygen mask. So we'll be separated. And in those circumstances, sometimes my husband and I will ask someone else, hey, would you mind switching so that we can sit together since we booked the, the, the uh, tickets together? I know that's right. not their responsibility. But people are so kind and so generous, yeah. so gracious, so willing to accommodate that, that it makes me feel less uncomfortable asking them. I've never actually, well, maybe once someone didn't want to, and I'm pretty sure they had just popped some sleeping pills and didn't even know what I was asking. <laughs> but most people are so kind and willing to do that, especially when it's a child that yeah. um, that's the only time I've ever asked. But yeah. Well, to me, it's uh, I've had the problem before where I've waited last minute to book a flight and it's, I can't find seats together for, for right. me with the two kids. And so what'll happen is I'll have like my daughter in the row in front of me and I'll have to book the this row behind her. And then, so I'm like my pitch to them, I'm like, hey, um, I'm sure you would love to have a three-year-old sit next to you on the plane, but just in case you don't, if you wanna just go ahead and like swap seats with me, I have the exact same seat, like just a row ahead of you or behind you. And generally they're like, oh my God, please don't. One guy actually was like, I'll sit with her, that's fine. And I was like, um, I, it was actually a little weird. And then we like negotiated a bit and obviously he switched, but either way. Um, and thank you to anybody who's willing to do that for parents, because it's stressful enough to travel with kids on a plane. Uh, my favorite plane uh, situations are whenever I'm sitting next to a dog, somebody me with a too. dog. It happened to me on Friday and it made my day. And this lady was so nice. She was like, I'm so glad you love animals. I was like, this is the best seat on the plane, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you for having me here. This is fantastic. So um, listen, Liz and Pam, we are out of time for today, but I want to say thank you to both of you for coming on the right view back for you, Liz. First time for you, Pam. We hope to get you back. It's a fun time. We absolutely love it. Um, and to everybody at home, if you liked this and you want to see more of it, please don't forget to follow us, to like, 
to share, to subscribe, to see more. Um, Liz and Pam, thank you. We'll see you guys back here next time. And everybody at home, as always, we'll see you back here next time for another episode of The Right View. At The Right View, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we are independent. We get to say everything that we think and everything that we feel. We have no woke companies guiding us or telling us what we can and cannot say. We are always going to shoot you straight and give you the facts as we know them. And that's why it's important to support independent uh, outlets like The Right View. My name is Lara Trump, and I think Mike Lindell is a patriot. He is someone who loves this country, is willing to fight for this country. Um, I love my pillow because not only are my pillows made in the USA by American workers, uh, but they're great products and they're so great that not only do I use them in my own bed at night, my children actually requested my daughter the other day went to the closet and pulled out a my pillow and said this is the pillow that i want to sleep with and i gotta tell you she loves it and will have nothing to do with any other pillow so it's a big hit around our house my dogs also uh happen to sleep on my pillow dog beds so all around the trump household we're big fans if you go to mypillow.com today and use promo code trump again promo code trump you will not only save money, but you will help us continue this show and other shows like it and help us continue the fight for the future of America. Inflation has impacted all of our lives. I don't think anyone can go to the gas pump or the grocery store without noticing that it is a major factor. And unfortunately, it's not going anywhere. It doesn't seem like it's going down in the way that we would like it to. And one way to protect your money is by investing in precious metals, uh, gold and silver. That's always been a great way to make sure that you keep your money and you keep it safe. When you go to bh-pm.com, use promo code TRUMP. That way, if you decide you want to invest in gold and silver, you'll save yourself a little bit of money. We live in a time that's very interesting. A lot of us out there feel like a lot of our rights are slipping away. And if you're like I am and you want to have the right to choose whether or not to have a vaccine, how to live your life freely, and you're looking for a great doctor, I've heard amazing things about Dr. Sherwood. He's somebody who you should really check out and check into, um, and it'll help support this program and keep us going. So go to Sherwood.tv and use promo code Trump. Again, Sherwood.tv and use promo code Trump. You can save yourself some money and help us keep our program going. Ladies and gentlemen, this just in. We'll keep this a little secret between you and me and them and everybody. Whoa. The people that are actually at the tip of the spear, working directly with President Trump on a day-to-day -day basis to save this nation, they're all joining us on the Reawaken America tour. We have Pre President Donald J. Trump's Chief of Staff, Akash Patel. We've got Peter Navarro who's joined us on the tour. We have General Michael Flynn. We have Eric Trump. The people actually working at the tip of the spear with President Donald J. Trump to save America are joining us on the Reawaken America tour. Whoa. If word of this gets out, if the truth about election fraud, medical fraud, religious fraud, monetary fraud, and mainstream media gets out, it may just save the nation. The Reawaken tour is coming to our place, hallelujah. It's going to be lit. It's going to be lit. Yeah, it's going to be lit. Wide slam open. And now, ladies and gentlemen, on May 12th and 13th, the Reawaken America Tour is coming to Miami, Florida, and to the beautiful Trump Doral Resort and Golf Course. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the Reawaken America Tour is coming to Miami, Florida on May 12th and 13th. Get your sunscreen ready because General Flynn, Mike Lindell, Amanda Grace, Julie Green, Pastor Dave Scarlett, Dr. Judy Mikevitz, Cash Patel, and Team America are taking the Reawaken America Tour to Trump Doral on May 12th and 13th. And then we're taking the God-fearing revival Bible starting Reawaken America Tour into Sin City. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking the God-fearing Reawaken America Tour to Las Vegas, Nevada on August 25th and 26th. General Flynn and Team America will be taking the Reawaken America Tour to Las Vegas, Nevada. And the Patriots will be staying together at Trump International Hotel Las Vegas, located at 2000 Fashion Show Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada, with zip code 89109.
line if you want to send them a letter. And yes, Alex Jones will be live and in person at the Reawaken America Tour, Las Vegas, Nevada. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, put it on your calendar. Get those tickets right now. August 25th and 26th, Eric Trump, Dr. Peter McCullough, Mel Kay, Dr. Stella Emanuel, Owen Troyer, Alex Jones, Seth Holhouse, Pastor Mark Burns, Pastor Leon Benjamin. We're all taking the Reawaken America Tour to Las Vegas, Nevada, ladies and gentlemen. Las Vegas, Nevada. And that's going to be August 25th and 26th. Thus far on the Reawaken America Tour, we've featured Dr. Dave Martin, the late great Dr. Vladimir Zelenko, Charlie Kirk, Donna Clement Petruska, Sean Foyt, Karen Kingston, Chad Prather, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Dr. Alan Keyes, Mickey Willis, Roger Stone, Dr. Richard Bartlett, and hundreds of patriotic speakers that you know, including Del Bigtree, Thomas Renz, Sidney Powell, Jim Caviezel, Donald J. Trump Jr., Peter Navarro, Klaus Schwab, Yuval Noah Harari, Bill Gates, and the godless globalists have their annual meeting called the World Economic Forum at Davos. But we that reject the Great Reset have the Reawaken America Tour coming to Miami, Florida, and come to Las Vegas, Nevada. Get those tickets at time2freeamerica.com. That's time2freeamerica.com. We have scholarship pricing to make these events affordable for everybody. Every Reawaken America Tour event has sold out, so request those tickets today at time2freeamerica.com. That's time2freeamerica.com. Or for faster service, you can send me a personal text to 918-851-0102. It's 918-851-0102. And to be bilingually sensitive, that's 918 918- Eight five Juan zero Juan zero two. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the, go. You know the you know the thing. We will shut you down. We will cite you, and if we need to, we will arrest you, and we will take you to jail. Period. I wasn't thinking of the Bill of Rights when we did this. But no amendment, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. God actually spoke to me. He spoke about sacredness. He said to me, Kim, what I place in many, many people is sacred. And if anybody touches what is sacred to me, then it is the end for them. So what I've done in the United States of America is sacred. And there are people on every side that are trying to destroy what I deem sacred. And it's not going to happen. This is the definition of criminal conspiracy, racketeering, and collusion. This is not a theory, this is evidence. Because I have upheld this country to spread a light to the rest of the world. When you choose to go against the sacred thing that God puts into the very heart and the soil of this nation, this was sacred to God. Now is the time to act. This is exactly why I need some action for my people. Hello, everybody. It's an honor to be with you.